Good morning, it's so good to see you this morning. And uh, do I look a little discombobulated? Today begins Holy Week. And I want you to know everything that's going on this week as far as Holy Week. Um, uh, Monday, Thursday, Thursday of this week. Monday means foot washing. And that's the day that Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Our Monday, Thursday service this week um, will be different. It's gonna be virtual. Pastor Trevor is leading some of our young people in, in presenting the service. And that will premiere on our um, Facebook page, on our website, at 7 p.m. that night. And then Good Friday, and Good Friday, that's the day um, that we remember that Jesus was arrested, um, tried, and then crucified and laid in a tomb. Our Good Friday services will be in person here at the church at noon and at 7 p.m. And also, we will be um, hosting early in the morning at 8 a.m., I believe. We'll be premiering an online service, so you can watch online if that's the way, if that's what works for you. Uh, whichever one of those works for you, uh, I hope you'll take part in it. And then next Sunday morning is Easter Sunday, and, and what a celebration. And the way that we'll celebrate this will be at Rest Haven Cemetery um, at uh, 6.30 in the morning. Um, bring your own lawn chair. Um, you may need to bring a flashlight. We'll do this weather permitting and um, we'll have a time there where we just celebrate and thank God for the power of resurrection and what that means. And you're encouraged after that service to go to the graves of friends and loved ones there and, um, and pray. Um, but 6.30 in the morning if you want to be a part of that. And then at 8.30 on Sunday morning and at 10.30 we'll be here in person in the sanctuary having um, our, our Easter celebration. We'd ask you to call and make reservations for that because we want to make sure there's enough room for everyone to be comfortable. And if we have too many people who call in, we'll just add another worship service. We will make it work. And the other thing that will happen on Sunday morning is, again, we'll have an online virtual service. We'll record a service, and that will premiere at 9.30 on Sunday morning, and you can watch um, at that time. You know, the most important thing about all of this is that we all have an experience of Holy Week. So that um, not only do we celebrate Palm Sunday, but we walk with Christ through this entire week. And then on Easter Sunday, on Easter Sunday, we can declare that Christ is risen and that we will too. So I hope you'll be a part of our Easter celebration.
morning, good morning. It's good to be with you. This is Palm Sunday. And um, if you've been around our church for a while, you know that this is my favorite Sunday. Um, I grew up in a Presbyterian church and we were a serious people, pretty serious about our faith. Um, and as a kid, I watched, you know, kind of that solemn seriousness. But that all changed on Palm Sunday because that was the day that we had palms and we paraded around and, um, and we were excited and happy. And I always loved Palm Sunday. This Palm Sunday obviously is different as it was in 2020 um, because of the pandemic. It's different in uh, what's happening in our world, but it's the same in terms of a celebration for who Christ is and what Christ is doing. Now we're recording this early so we can have it um, online for you. So our palms haven't arrived here at the church. You are at home and maybe you don't have palms there. So I'm gonna ask you to improvise. I want you to do something in terms of a parade. I want you to remember that Pastor Cindy, when she was a child, needed smiles and excitement in her church. So wherever you do in church today, I hope you'll do that. I do have on my Palm Sunday socks. I wore them. I have a Palm Sunday bracelet that a lovely person in our church made from the palms from previous years. So I'm kind of decked out and ready. Don't have a palm, but I have a towel. So I encourage you, wherever you are, even if you're in your home alone, to somehow parade, wave something around, and um, shout Hosanna um, in celebration of who this Christ is, who's come to be with us. Welcome to worship today.
Alice, it's good to be with you. Um, this is one of the most important times of the week for Miss Alice and I, right? It is very yeah, important. Yep. We love children's time, and this Sunday is a really special Sunday. You know what Sunday this is? Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, and you know, like in my heart, that's like it's my favorite, favorite Sunday. Mm -hmm. When I was a little child, I was in a church that was pretty serious. And you all know that church people can kind of be kind of serious sometimes. We're not. <laughs> yeah, we're the exception. But church people can be, and, and sometimes rightly so. But in my church, people were serious. Um, and But then on Palm Sunday, everybody laughed and smiled, and we had a palm parade. And it was so fun. It was so fun. And so because of that, I love Palm Sunday. So I have to show you a couple things. I have... Palm Sunday socks. See my socks? They have palms on them. I've never seen anything like say. that. I know, but they've got, those are palms for sure. They are. They also have a giraffe, but here they have palms on them. So there you go. And then there's a lovely man from our church who made this bracelet for me. And what he did was he made the beads, and the beads are made out of palms that he dried. So I even have a Palm Sunday bracelet. Now, we're going to make palms because that's part of Palm Sunday is to have a palm branch from a tree. So we're just going to take construction paper and just kind of tear it. We're not even using scissors and make it kind of a silly looking leaf. And you at your house, if you want to, you can use something, some construction paper maybe or a newspaper or even a magazine, any kind of paper you have. And you could kind of make a leaf, like this. And Palm Sunday is the Sunday when Jesus came into Jerusalem. How are you doing there? Good, good, all right. Palm Sunday is the Sunday when Jesus came into the city of Jerusalem and the people met him and they took their palm branches and they waved them like this and they said hello to Jesus with their palm branches. Lots of and children. Welcomed him. Lots of children. Lots of children. And it was just an exciting parade. And they said, Hosanna, which Hosanna. means save us, which means Jesus, come and be part of our lives and save us. Now, Alex, question for you. Do you think to celebrate Palm Sunday, you have to have palm socks? No, because I don't have them, and I'm going to celebrate a big time. <laughs> and do you have to have a beautiful bracelet like this? It's you beautiful. just have to be one of God's children. Do you even have to have a palm? Nope. Nope. What you have to do, though, is to be willing to just say, Jesus, it's so good that you're here, right? Whether you have palms or you're just using your hands. Hands can be a palm. They can be a palm, too. So what we encourage you to do, kiddos, and maybe some of you older kiddos, um, adults, um, to somehow this day wave your arms, accept, and be excited about Jesus coming Shout, Hosanna, Jesus, come and save us from this mess. And um, I also just know in looking ahead, this year we probably can't have a palm parade, but you know what? We will next year, absolutely, without a doubt, because um, hope is on its way. So we're going to say a prayer about that? We are. Okay, and we, have our, we did make our palm branches, and you do whatever's fun for you as a way to celebrate palm If you want Sunday. to send a picture to the church, we'd love to see your palms. Mm -hmm. And today, there will be Sunday school right after um, uh, worship today, and Pastor Trevor can send you a link so you can be a part of our Zoom Sunday school. But we need to pray about this. Jesus came into Jerusalem, and there was a parade, and people were excited and happy. So, Miss Alice, can we pray? And if you say a line, I'll repeat it. All right. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for sending Jesus. Into our lives into our lives and into our world and into our world it's much better it's much better with the hope of jesus with the hope of jesus amen 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 so however you're celebrating today i pray that you're doing some sort of celebration um, that you're full of smiles and excitement jesus is on his way hi my name is Braden hine and my name is Jarrett Hine. And my name is Colin Hine. And these are today's readings. Mark 11, verses 1 through 11. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, 
near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter, you will find tied there a colt that was never that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says you to you, Why are you doing this? Just say, The Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door, outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what, what are you doing, untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed with one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. John twelve twenty four to twenty five. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Mark fourteen thirty two through thirty six. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, "Sit here while I pray." He took with him Peter and James and John. He began to be distressed and agitated, and he said to them, "I am deeply grieved, and even to death. Remain here and keep awake." And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I want, but what e you want. May God and God's blessings to the reading, hearing, and living of Scripture. Amen. As I said at the beginning of worship today, um, Palm Sunday was my favorite Sunday when I was a child. It was just so exciting. And so today to revisit this, to look at, at what Jesus was doing, um, I love this Sunday. I want to tell you a little bit about the setting that's happening here. Um, we're recording. Um, we do this a couple days ahead of time so that we can make it all work and get it online to you. Um, I'm in the sanctuary. The candles are lit behind me. This is this holy place. Pastor Trevor is here as well. He's doing the recording today. Um, you know, when we worship, we come together. And, and I always regret this part, that we, we are not together, that we can't... Um, uh, all be in one place. So I want you to sort of know what's happening here. And also when I preach, I'm conscious that someone's listening and it's so frustrating that I can't see you when I'm preaching um, online. But I can see Pastor Trevor. And so there may be times in my service sermon today when I'm going to ask him a question or you know, look to him to see if this is making sense. So there's a lot riding on Pastor Trevor today. I want you to know that. But I want to welcome you into this time as we think about this scripture. It's Palm Sunday. Um, Palm Sunday today is actually regarded as Palm Passion Sunday. This is the beginning of Holy Week. And the week begins with a parade and it continues then through Holy Thursday when Jesus served the Last Supper to his disciples and when he washed their feet. And then later that night he was arrested. It'll continue Holy Week into Good Friday when Jesus is crucified and laid in a tomb. And next Sunday we celebrate Easter. But you know, we really can't get to Easter 
um, unless we understand all that's happened during the week, unless we understand what Christ has done each day. So I hope that you'll um, be part of our worship services. Um, I hope you'll read the scriptures that, that tell of this last week of Jesus' life. It's just such a rich um, experience, and it really it changed the world, and we need to be part of it. So today is the last Sunday in Lent, and our sermon series this year has been called The Way. And each Sunday, we're looking at the way of Christ, at the character of Christ. A few weeks ago, I asked our staff to tell me what they found so compelling about Jesus Christ. And each one of them, it was just curious, each one of them described a different facet of Christ's life. Um, and you know, it's sort of that way. Like, we never know anyone in their fullness. We each know people in a certain way. And I think with Jesus Christ, we know people, we need know Christ in the way that we need to know Christ at that time. Last week when Pastor Trevor preached, he, he talked about that, that oftentimes what we find compelling about Jesus Christ is the very thing that we need to be working on at that moment, at that time. So each of our staff people, and it's so, uh, you have a very good staff here at the church, and it's so interesting to hear what they had to say. Nancy Setchell is the director of our preschool. She said she was just so impressed that Jesus came in human form. And I, I like to think that Jesus became human so each of us human beings could become holy. Kenton Jordan, our director of music, said that he found so compelling about Jesus Christ is the way that Christ can step into the storms of our lives and bring calm. And I think every one of us have relied on that at one time. Rachel Olson is our director of administration, and she finds the way of Christ is, um, is a journey toward peace. And, and she feels herself to be on that journey and that Christ offers this peace, as scripture says, that passes understanding. Last Sunday, um, well, two weeks ago, I um, preached about Pastor Trevor, what he thought about Jesus Christ. And, and his sense is that Jesus invites and welcomes and then transforms. Um, it is the shared relationship that makes such a difference. And then last Sunday, Pastor Trevor preached on what I find so compelling right now about Jesus Christ, and that's that Jesus was defiant. That Jesus had clear understanding of what was right and what was wrong, and he would stand up sometimes and just say, this has to stop. Um, this can't go on. And um, I admire him for that, for his sense of mercy and justice and forgiveness. Um, this week, this week, the last person on our staff who's... Uh, sort of testifying is, is Dave Miller. And Dave Miller is our building supervisor. He makes sure that the building is in good shape when people arrive here. Um, he is an extremely kind man. He keeps an eye out for what people need and he seems to just anticipate and he's ready um, to provide what people need, maybe before they even know they need it. He um, said that what he finds so compelling about Jesus Christ is his willingness to sacrifice on behalf of others. Dave sacrifice, that was the key word. And then Dave said this, and I've been thinking about it ever since he told me this. He said, all of life depends on sacrifice. I often ask you to be your own theologian, to determine um, your relationship with God, to, to pray, to enter into scripture, to, um, to work out um, what you, who you think God is. And so I want to ask you that. Do you agree with Dave that all of life depends on sacrifice? You know, he noted that, you know, um, mothers, you know, they give up their body to bear a child. Um, he looked at uh, animals. We use them for meat, um, plants, for food. That there is this whole cycle of sacrifice going on all the time. And that we too are called into that giving up something of ourselves for the well-being of others. That's one definition of sacrifice. Giving up something of ourselves for the well-being of others. So if you were here, I would have this debate with you. Do you think Dave is right? That all of life depends on sacrifice. Sacrifice, that's our focus for today. Will you pray with me? Good and holy God, you place this scripture before us. You give us this Christ who leads us. And now we wonder about this whole notion of sacrifice. How are we to be in relationship with one another? Um, do we really give over to each other? And, and does that make life possible? Is this the way that you love us? 
what did Christ really do that last week of his life? And how did that change things? We come to you, Lord, with more questions than answers. But you are a good and faithful God. You lead us, you guide us, you direct us. Help us to understand what this whole notion of sacrifice means. Draw us close. Look kindly on this preacher and on everyone anywhere who's listening today to these words. Um, let, uh, let the words of our mouths, the words of our thoughts, let it all be acceptable to you. We pray this in the strong and certain name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, so I thought, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be preaching about sacrifice. So um, each week when I prepare a sermon, um, I do a lot of reading. I know Pastor Trevor does this too, a lot of research. And so I stepped into this topic of sacrifice, and I immediately realized I had stepped into kind of a, a complicated mess. First of all, let me just say this. Sacrifice is not very popular right now. Over the ages in the church, it, there were times when it was more, more um, popular. And, and I think maybe during World War II um, in our communities, it was more popular to sacrifice on behalf of others. But right now we seem to be in a time of fierce independence. Um, right now, for better or for worse, we tend to want what we want when we want it. And um, the idea of giving up something for someone else for the sake of others is just not very popular. If you look at our culture, our advertising, um, we're sadly pretty self-centered. Um, that can be up for debate. It's just the way it seems to me and the things I read. Second thing, this whole notion of sacrifice has been abused. Too often, sacrifice has been the result of coercion or manipulation. Too often, sacrifice is what others do for us and not what we do for others. Sometimes sacrifice is what one person or group expects another person or group to do. Maybe one gender expects the other gender to make the sacrifice. Maybe the rich expect the poor to make the sacrifice. One race expects another race to make a sacrifice. Sacrifice being acceptable, even expected, as long as somebody else is doing it and it benefits me. Sometimes sacrifice too has become self-aggrandizing. Have you ever heard somebody sort of say, oh yeah, you know, I, I did that. I, I just wanted to help. And you somehow have a sense that all that they're saying is a way of puffing themselves up. Um, it, it's something like us personally giving up our time or our resources so that others can know that we've really done something special. Um, we are really swell. All of this, I think, is a distortion of what sacrifice really is, at least how I understand it. It makes sacrifice sound like a game or some sort of power play or, or some sort of um, effort to gain control. The idea of sacrifice um, may bring up Old Testament images of animals placed on altars and slaughtered. Um, the book of Leviticus offers all kinds of instructions for doing just that, for animal sacrifices. And slaughtering an animal was a way of atoning for sin. In other words, you've done something wrong, bring pigeons, bring a calf, bring a lamb to the altar. Um, that animal becomes the scapegoat, takes on the burden of our sin, and, um, and then is put to death. They pay for our errors. It was meant to bring a person back into right relationship with God and community, to offer a sacrifice. Progress through the Old Testament and the prophets begin to complain about what's happening with this notion of animal sacrifices. They become empty rituals. Um, I once heard a country singer with a, a song he'd sung that, that he was in a routine of um, party on Friday, sin on Saturday, confess on Sunday. And the same thing happened again, though, the next week. It was just a cycle. And that's sort of what happened with the animal rituals, or animal um, sacrifices. Um, it was a way of paying off for sin, um, the sin of Saturday, sacrifice on Sunday, and then just repeat the next week. It cost the animal its life, but it made very little difference in the heart of the sinner. 
I don't think that that's what Jesus thought about sacrifice or what Dave Miller, our building supervisor, thought about sacrifice. I don't think Jesus saw sacrifice as manipulation or self-aggrandizing. There are lots of theories about atonement and you can investigate those. Um, lots of theories about what Jesus' death meant to us, but I don't see it as paying God off. Old Testament prophets then will preach against this sort of thing. They will tell the people that God does not want empty rituals. Instead, what God really wants is a contrite heart, a good heart. I think at the core of sacrifice, of true sacrifice, is that. It is the work of a good heart, a heart filled with love. Giving of ourselves for the good of others without some sort of ulterior motive, no manipulation, simply because that's what a loving heart does. This is the way Jesus offered himself. There was no manipulation. He gave himself up as an act of love. I think it's hard for us to imagine this sort of love. And it may seem weak. It may seem like a pushover if you're just loving and caring for other people. Surely you'll be taken advantage of. But if you look closer, if you look at what Christ did during this Holy Week, loving for the sake of love itself takes incredible strength. On that first Palm Sunday, Jesus rode into Jerusalem. He had intentionally come to Jerusalem because it was the center of power, misused power that caused lots and lots of suffering. The Roman army was in, in full um, authority in Jerusalem. And they often had displays of power and might. They would come parading into Jerusalem on their horses, um, hundreds of soldiers following them. Um, they would demand that the people, as they watch, shout things like, Hail Caesar and Caesar is Lord. They governed in a way that kept the poor, poor and destitute and desperate. And they used violence to enforce their rule. Violence was very much a part of who they were part of their identity. The other power of the day were the religious authorities of the time, and they colluded often with Rome. Um, they were part of this power structure. They lost sight of compassion. They lost sight of mercy. They lost sight of the value of a human being. They no longer cared about the needs of the people. So all of this is centered in Jerusalem, and on that first Palm Sunday, Jesus put himself right in the middle of it. Um, he, had a, he made a mockery of power of the day. He rode in on a colt, which is always kind of amusing. Maybe that's part of why the people in my Presbyterian church back in the day could smile. You can imagine Jesus on this small pony. Maybe his feet were drug as he walked through the city. People came out and they ripped branches out of trees and, and they laid them in the street. They um, laid their cloaks in the street and he rode that donkey across it. They didn't shout, Caesar is Lord. They didn't even shout, Jesus is Lord. They simply shouted, Hosanna. Hosanna. You know, now it, it's uh, the word we use with our palm parade, but for the people of that time, it simply meant save us. And this year, when we think about Palm Sunday, and if you've already had your parade and you shouted Hosanna, think about what it means. We're saying to God, save us. We're in a mess here. Save us. Jesus rode into the center of their suffering, brought his good heart, his heart so aligned with God, um, he brought it right to the center of their pain. Jesus was determined to live that goodness, to offer his goodness, no matter what it cost him. I think that's the power of sacrifice. All of life depends on our caring for others, offering ourselves for the well-being of others, that's the message of Jesus' life. Our second scripture for today is the words of Christ, and he talks about a, a grain of wheat, how it remains a single grain unless it falls to the earth and breaks open and gives itself over and grows into a new stock of wheat. Unless it gives itself to the purpose God created for it, the seed makes little difference in the world. Hear the words. Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. 
tough words to hear, but the idea I think is that if we become too protective of our lives, if we even claim our lives as our own, not belonging to God, but just our own, kind of our own playthings, um, we'll never really live. Because life, because life is in the grace of God. In the last scripture for today, Jesus prays. And he has some sense of what's, he, what's ahead for him. I'm sure he'll soon be arrested. He will suffer. This is not what he wants. He's not trying to be a martyr. He's not self-aggrandizing. He's not showing off. Um, but this, he's facing what he's facing. And we hear the words of his prayer calling out to God saying, not what I want, but what you want. He offers himself to God, aligning himself with God's loving spirit. We will not be called to offer ourselves at the level Christ did. We are not Christ. We don't have his capability. We will not face crucifixion. But his prayer, not what I want, but what you want, that has to be our prayer too. It pulls us out of our selfishness and into the loving heart and the loving ways of God. It calls us to open ourselves to the needs of others. Last week, the Des Moines Register carried the stories of the Red Cross heroes of the heartland. And so uh, it's always impressive to, to hear what people have done for others. Tom Horton and Jeff Abbas were playing soccer when their friend Mark Grief collapsed uh, with a cardiac arrest. And Horton and Abbas immediately administered CPR until the paramedics arrived and they're credited with saving his life. Valerie Yukon, a member of the Yankton Sioux Tribe, used her own money to open the Urban Native Center in Sioux City, where she provides a food pantry, housing assistance, addiction recovery, and cultural programs to indigenous people in Sioux City. Mary Margaret Butler of Atumwa founded the Whatsoever You Do organization in Atumwa. And it's a nonprofit organization that provides food and uh, clothing and furniture in a homeless shelter. And it's based on the scripture from Matthew 25, Whatsoever you do for the least of these, you do for me. Words of Christ. The Des Moines Airport police came to the rescue of Jordan Wise when he had a heart attack and they saved his life. These are all heroes. But again, sacrifice, I don't think, is about becoming a hero. It's really at that moment when someone, all of us, when we're tending to ourselves, and then the moment when it flips, and when we discover that there's a world around us and there are people around us and they need us. And God gives us a purpose to do in that moment, some way that we can care for others. It's this quiet little moment when love transfers from one soul to another. And I believe that all of life depends on it. It's when kindness is extended, when we give up a bit of who we are for the well-being of other people. So a good parent sacrifices time and energy to love a child and raise them up. A teacher sets aside things that he or she might have wanted to do on a particular afternoon to spend extra time with a child to teach them to read and to count. A friend shows up with tools and a ladder because last night's storm ripped shingles off a house and and a friend needs help. Someone invites the neighbors to come and sit in their driveway just to talk because the winter has been long and we are lonely and others need to hear a human voice. A neighbor on their way to run errands stops to check in on someone and just to listen. And listening is perhaps the biggest sacrifice we can make these days. Listening is in very short supply we do a lot, a lot of talking. We don't do as much listening. And listening can have a healing presence for people. We give blood because someone we don't, probably people we don't know, needs it, needs our blood to survive. 
And we don't do all of this just for other people. We do this for creation as well. We recycle, we rel limit the resources we use, we clean up the planet because the planet really belongs to God and other people live on it too. And, and it's a way of sacrificing for the greater good. And all of this, all of this is sacrifice, caring, kindness, setting aside our needs so that life can be better for all of us. These are the sacrifices we're called to make. And the more we make them, the more it changes our hearts. The more our hearts open up, the more grace grows in us, like that grain of wheat. The more we see the needs of the world around us, the more we discover our purpose in caring and kindness, the more we feel alive the more we find ourselves in this sacrificial living, not because we're coerced, not because we hope to be heroes or that we're particularly swell, becoming the martyr of the year, but because Dave Miller is right. All of life depends on sacrifice, on our caring for other people, because that's what Jesus was doing in the streets of Jerusalem on that day. He heard the cries of the people and he responded, we do this because within the sacrificial love of Christ, we have found life. Amen. Well, this morning, I want to invite you to pray with me as we ponder what sacrifice means for us. Let's pray. Holy God, we give you thanks for your example, your example of sacrifice. And we are about to enter this holy week where we're really gonna learn more about what that means. About how not just others sacrifice for us, but really what it means to follow this way you have led to sacrifice ourselves. Show us what that means, God, in big ways and in small, what it means to sacrifice. You know, God, that we come to you with a lot of weight, a lot of things that we carry, heavy things, good things full of joy and things that just weigh us down. So we bring all of it to you today. God, you know us. And in your knowing us, may you free us, that we may follow this way, whatever it entails, God, we are. We are in it to follow this journey with you. And we pray together the way you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
because it's us together. It's a celebration every Sunday um, of the good news that God is with us, of the good news of Jesus Christ. Palm Sunday, this is Palm Sunday, and, and this is the day when we remember, you know, with just a simple symbol of palms. Um, the people tore them out of the trees and they laid them on the road and they shouted Hosanna. And now thousands of years later, a simple palm can help us remember that Christ is with us. May the love of God, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you now and always and give you life.